Today on The King is Coming. There's something about human nature. You tell people there's one thing you can't do, that becomes the one thing they want to do. If I said to my students at Liberty, here's a hundred candy bars lined up on a table. You can have every single one of them you want except the peppermint patty. I guarantee you some of them would go right straight to the peppermint patty. Hello, I'm Ed Heinsen. I'm the teacher on the King is Coming broadcast, but I'm also a professor at Liberty University in Virginia, and I've had the privilege of teaching 100,000 students in the last 30 years. I love to take the Bible, open the Word of God, and make the complicated simple and apply it to people's lives. I want to be your teacher and walk you through the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, the beginning of the human race, the beginning of the Hebrew race, the beginning of the plan of salvation in the Word of God. And my prayer is, it will be a brand new beginning for you. or visit thekingiscoming.com to order your copy. Again, that's 1-800-622-2767 or visit The King is Coming today. The Bible is the most important book ever written, the most powerful, the most insightful, and the most interesting. And yet many people open their Bible and say, I don't quite understand it or I don't get it. You have to study it in its proper context and then it'll make perfect sense and the Spirit of God will speak to your heart and change your life. What I want to do in this series is just sit down with you casually and walk through the Word of God starting with the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. The title comes from the Latin word for beginnings. It's the book of the beginnings. It's the story of God beginning to create and God beginning to redeem. If you have a Bible available to you, take it and turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and notice how the very first book of the Bible actually begins as we walk through the Scripture uh, together. Genesis 1-1 says, In the beginning God created. Uh, it was written originally in the Hebrew language. Bereshit, bara, elchim. God Almighty created, not took existing material and shaped it and formed it, but He created it from nothing. As you read that chapter, it'll say again and again, and God said, let there be light. And God said, uh, let the waters be divided. And God said, let there be dry land, etc. God is creating the world from nothing. Theologians call that ex nihilo. He created it from nothing by the power of His spoken word. But when it says in the beginning, it's not the beginning of God. God has always existed and always will exist. It's the beginning of the natural world as we know it today. It's the beginning of the material creation. In the beginning, God, who is immaterial, created material and substance. He did it instantaneously. He did it by the power of His spoken word. If I could say, for example, a coffee cup appear, uh, and it could appear out of nowhere from nothing, and it had material substance, uh, it would appear to have age, even though it's technically brand new. So He's going to create uh, Adam and Eve, full grown. Uh, he's going to create animals, full grown. 
He's not evolving the world. He is creating the world by the power of His spoken word. Now think of what that means. The word of God is essential to understanding the Bible because the Bible itself is called what? The word of God. The story of the beginning, the creation of the human race, uh, our ancestral parents, Adam, Adam means uh, earth man, a uh, dust man, uh, who ends up becoming a dirt ball, if you will. Uh, Isha, or Eve, the mother of all living. And God sets them in the Garden of Eden and gives them every opportunity to have the most uh, unimaginable life, uh, the most beautiful life possible. Created in a state of innocence, they're like a blank slate. Uh, they're not righteous, but they're not unrighteous. And God gives them a simple series of moral tests serve me, run the garden, uh, moderate over the creation, and, uh, but, but there's one tree in the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, don't eat of the fruit of that tree. The problem then becomes they can eat of any tree in the garden, but that one tree? Now there's something about human nature. You tell people there's one thing you can't do, that becomes the one thing they want to do. If I said to my students at Liberty, here's a hundred candy bars lined up on a table. You can have every single one of them you want, except the peppermint patty. I guarantee you, some of them would go right straight to the peppermint patty. Oh, that looks pretty good to me. Uh, it looks like it might taste good. Uh, why can't we have the peppermint patty? And eventually, Satan uses the serpent to speak to Eve to say, God's really being unfair to you. Did he say you can't eat of any of these trees? No, he said, you can't eat of that one tree. So he distorts the Word of God. And then eventually he denies the Word of God. You will not surely die. Go ahead and try it. It'll make you wise and you'll be like God. And we find the very first temptation then in Genesis, the third chapter. Uh, the fruit on the tree is never named. We don't really know if it was an apple. Could have been an orange or a lemon. But it was pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the eyes. It looked like it would taste good, the lust of the flesh. And it was desired to make one wise. And she and Adam give in. And immediately they die spiritually. But not physically. Eve didn't fall over dead. So Adam thought, give me a bite of that thing and chomp the whole thing down. And then all of a sudden they sense their guilt, their inadequacy, and they run away from God. They're hiding from God. They're hiding in the trees. And God comes walking into the garden in Genesis, the third chapter, like a parent, calling out to them, Adam, earth man, where are you? And his response is, nah, we're over here in the trees. Why? What have you done? God does not make any indictments at that point. God is simply asking the convicting question. And how many times the Spirit of God speaks to our hearts and does the same thing? Hey, what are you doing? Why are you there? What's going on? And with all the masculine leadership that Adam could muster, he blamed Eve. He said, this is a woman you gave me. Uh, it's her fault. And God said to Eve, what have you done? And she said, the, the serpent made me do it. They have only been in sin for a few moments, and they're blaming God. It's the woman you gave me. Uh, they're blaming each other, or they're blaming the devil. When you and I fall into sin, that's exactly what we tend to want to do. That's the temptation. The tempter says, oh, go ahead. It won't hurt you. It won't kill you. And as soon as you give in to it, he goes, ah, you did it. And Satan means the accuser. He loves to accuse our failures, and he strikes out at the creation of God, hoping to destroy the human race. And yet in that third chapter of Genesis, God in His grace steps down into the darkness of that moment, down into that fallen place. God came walking in the garden. He didn't call them up to heaven. God came down to the point of their need, calling them to Himself. Come out from the trees. Come to me. Let me help you. I can fix this. And in that third chapter of Genesis, we read that God slays the first animal makes the first sacrifice, sheds the first blood, and makes an atonement for their sin, and covers their inadequacy. From the very beginning, the idea of sacrifice 
leaps from the pages of the Bible that God is willing to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And then he gives them the very first prophecy of the Bible. In Genesis, the third chapter, in verse 15, the scripture gives you a prediction about somebody that's coming into the human race. You might take your Bible and turn to that passage. In Genesis 3.15, the Lord Himself spoke to Eve and said, I will put enmity, animosity, uh, between you, Satan, and the woman, between your seed and her seed. It will bruise your head, but you will bruise his heel. He's giving a warning to Satan himself that you're not going to win this battle ultimately. I will send somebody into the human race, the seed of the woman, who will ultimately crush your head, but in the process will bruise his heel. You have what is often called the Proto-Evangelium, the first evangel, the first gospel message starts right there. Somebody's coming, but he doesn't tell you who, he doesn't tell you when, it's going to be a long time before Jesus will arrive, and yet the Bible foresees the time when the Son of God Himself will step into the human race to atone for our sin, and interestingly, when He's crucified on the cross, and they drive the nails through His wrists, and then the spikes through His feet, they bend the legs so that you can dig into the back of the cross with your heels pull against the spikes and stand up, <gasps> gasping for breath, because as you're hanging there, your rib cage is pushing against your diaphragm. You can't breathe. Eventually, you'll suffocate. And a person on a cross had to pull himself up and down hundreds of times, gasping for air. That's why Jesus will eventually say, I thirst, uh, breathing through his mouth, pushing, pulling, straining, and historians tell us crucifixion victims tore the flesh off the back of their heels, bruised their heels against the base of the cross, pushing and pulling and straining. And in that moment of bruising, God the Father lays the sin of mankind on the Son of God on the cross. Jesus will die on the cross in only about three hours from a broken heart brought on by suffocation because eventually his heart will explode in that moment. And yet in that moment he will shout, it is finished, in triumph. And the Greek New Testament uses the word tetelestai, which literally means paid in full. He's not dying the death of a martyr or a victim. He's dying in our place. A substitute who loved you so much, he went to the cross to atone for our sins, and to fulfill that prophecy that somebody would come into the human race and crush the head of the serpent. And yet as time unfolds in the Bible, everything seems to ultimately be going wrong in the Old Testament. Uh, the descendants of Adam and Eve, some of them are in the godly line of Seth, but some are in the ungodly line of Cain. And eventually the flood comes and nearly wipes them all out, but God intervenes again in grace, and the Scripture tells us the reason that Noah and his family survived the flood was because Noah found grace uh, in the eyes of the Lord. That verse is found in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. That grace, it's chen in the Hebrew language, that favor of God, that blessing of God, undeserved, is given as a free gift. And we begin to understand that even in the Old Testament, Salvation is really ultimately by the grace of God. A God who loves you so much, He will go out of His way to redeem us from our sins and our failures and our mistakes. God redeems Noah and his family. He gives the human race another chance to start all over again. Uh, and yet, after the flood, mankind is running away from God. You could illustrate it if you took a bag of marbles and shook them all up and dumped them on this table, they'd go rolling all over the place. But God in His grace reached down and picked up one marble, so to speak, one man, Abram, Abram, the short form of his name, great father, I'll start all over with you. I'll send the Redeemer through your line, through a promised son that will come. That promise will be to you and to your descendants. 
and we begin to see unfolding in Scripture the promises that will lead us ultimately to the person of Jesus Christ Himself. Abraham lives in about 2000 B.C., 2000 years before the time of Jesus, and yet the book of Genesis will say, I'm going to send the Redeemer through your line, Abraham, through you, through your son Isaac, uh, through his son Jacob, uh, through his son Judah. And later the Old Testament is going to tell us that the Redeemer will come from the line of King David and eventually there are over 100 prophecies of the coming of Christ in the Old Testament. Every single one of them was literally fulfilled in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. That means mathematically it would be trillions upon trillions upon trillions of chances that any one individual could literally fulfill every one of those prophecies. Born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, will ride into town on a donkey, be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, etc. All of those prophecies were fulfilled by Jesus who understood it's for this reason that I have come into the world. I have come to die. I have come to take the punishment for the sins of mankind. I have come as the promised Messiah. I have come as the Savior. I have come as the Son of God. One of the themes that emerges out of the book of Genesis is that of the Lamb. Uh, Abraham finally has this promised son that he's waited for uh, for so many years. Uh, Isaac. Uh, and initially he believes the promise of God. And so much time goes by, he and Sarah don't have a son, and when God finally says, you'll have the son at a hundred, Abraham falls on his face and laughs at God. And God says, you think it's funny? We're going to name the kid funny. We're going to name him Yitzach. Isaac uh, in Hebrew means laughter. You're laughing at me, but you'll be laughing with me because it's going to happen. By the time you get to Genesis 21, the promised child is born, Isaac, and they're laughing for joy. They're rejoicing. But about 20 years goes by, and when you come to chapter 22, God tells Abraham, take that son, that one that I promised you, that one that I said through him, I'm going to send the Redeemer, I'm going to bring a blessing to the whole world, take him to Mount Moriah, sacrifice him on a mountain there to me. Now that's totally contrary to the character and nature of God. Uh, God is against child sacrifice. The Bible makes that very, very clear. He's putting Abraham to the test. Abraham is about 120 by now, and as an old man, he's not going to argue with God anymore. He decides, all right, if that's what you want, I'll take him there, but he can't die. He takes Isaac and two servants. They travel to Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is in Jerusalem. Uh, it's part of the mountain of the outcropping of Golgotha where 2,000 years later, Jesus will carry the wood of the cross, where He'll go to be crucified and bruise His heel, and die in our place. And it's there that He takes Isaac, His son, binds him, which Isaac had to willingly let him do, and laid him on the altar, took out the knife, and then God shouts to him from heaven, what? Stop! Don't do it! It's only a test. And I think Abraham knew that. As we'll study this book, we'll see in chapter 22, as he leaves the two servants, he says to them, the boy and I are going to go up there and worship God, and we, not I, we will return. We will be back. And when they are on their way, Isaac turns to his father and says, Dad, where's the lamb? You forgot the lamb for the sacrifice. And Abraham said what? The Lord Himself will provide the lamb. And when the angel of the Lord spoke to him from heaven, Christ Himself shouting from heaven, and He tells him, stop, don't do it, He's really saying, I'll do it for you. Turn around, Abraham, and there in a thicket is a ram, a male lamb, caught by its horns. Sacrifice the lamb instead. And that becomes a picture then that runs all the way through the Bible. In John chapter 1, when John the Baptist saw Jesus walking toward Him for the first time. What did He say? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He understood who He was. He understood why He had come. And when you go all the way to the end of the Bible, to the book of Revelation, you go to that sixth chapter of Revelation, 
John has been caught up into the throne room of heaven. And yet while he's there, he realizes there's no one in heaven angelic, nobody on earth human, nobody under the earth demonic, who has divine authority to come and take the scroll from the hand of God the Father, uh, break the seals, open the scroll, read the judgments, bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, and he begins to sob and cry out of control in heaven. And one of the elders tells him, stop, dry it up, John. Look, there's the answer. And he looks up and he says this in the sixth chapter, or the fifth chapter of Revelation. Uh, John says, I looked up and there was a lamb as though it had been slain seated in the throne with God the Father. The Lamb is co-equal with the Father. The deity of Christ shouts to you through the pages of the Bible. This is not an idea that theologians made up centuries later. No, Jesus dared to say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, that I and the Father are one. And in the book of Revelation, 28 times Jesus is pictured as the Lamb, the Lamb, the Lamb, with the wounds of the cross, a lamb as though it had been slain. For even in a glorified, resurrected body, he still had the nail prints. He showed those to the disciples to convince them, it's really me, and I believe he'll have those for all eternity. And they will shout to us forever and ever, I love you, I love you, I love you. I did it all for you. The Savior, with the wounds of the cross, with the bruised heels, crushes the power of Satan, defeats him forever, and makes available to you and me forgiveness, salvation, and transformation. As we study the book of Genesis, we'll discover God doesn't just forgive your sins. That would leave you blank. He gives you the gift of righteousness, like a robe of righteousness that you do not deserve, you could never earn. It's a free gift. I want you to receive it from me. And as we study this book together in the weeks ahead, my prayer is that the book of Genesis will come alive in your heart and mind, and you'll begin to realize it's the foundation book for every other book of the Bible. To understand the Bible, I need to understand this book. I need to put its principles into action in my life, and I need to know the one who loved me enough to bruise his heels, to take the nails in his hands and feet, and die in my place because He loved me like no one will ever love me. If you want to know Him, trust Him today. He is the answer to everything in your life. Dr. Heinsohn's latest eight-part CD audio series, Genesis, How It All Began, is available now and is yours today as our thank you for any donation to the ministry. Journey with us across the sands of time as we discover Jesus in the very foundations of humanity. That grace, it's chen in the Hebrew language, that favor of God, that blessing of God, undeserved, is given as a free gift. Genesis, How It All Began, will challenge you to realize that God had a plan for your life from the very beginnings of our world. Order your copy today on CD by simply donating any amount to the ministry. Also, for a specific gift, you can request your copy of this anointed series on DVD. To order, call us toll-free at 1-800-622-2767 or visit thekingiscoming.com today. The Bible follows the rise and fall of kingdoms, covers history throughout the ages, and reveals God's plan for humanity. Charting of the Bible chronologically is a must-have book by authors Dr. Ed Heinsohn and Thomas Ice. Included in this book's 40-plus full-color charts are a timeline of biblical history, overviews of major empires, a master fold-out chart of the entire Bible, and much more. To order your copy, call us at 1-800-622-2767 or visit thekingiscoming.com today. My guest today is Barry Stagner, the pastor of Calvary Chapel in Tustin, California. Barry, as a pastor, I'm sure a lot of young people in your church will come to you and say, wow, at school I'm hearing everything about evolution, and yet the Bible talks about creation. In the beginning, God created the world, and yet evolutionary science would say, no, no, not really. It all sort of evolved from energy and matter. 
uh, as a pastor, how do you respond to that? Well, I think it's critically important that we address this particular issue in light of the fact that uh, Martin Luther said, if we fight on any battlefront other than the one currently under attack, we're not really in the battle. And this is the battlefront on the campuses around our country today. And really, I think the advantage that the biblical narrative has over gradualism or materialism, whatever label you want to put on it, is that you would find that the modern evolutionary teacher doesn't go all the way back to the beginning. They come to a point and then they cannot give an explanation as to first life. Even great antagonists like Richard Dawkins will not touch the first life issue. Where did it come from? How did it form? What was it? Yet the Bible begins with the very initiation of life in the beginning God created. And we have an intelligent answer to the accusations being made about the creative narrative. Now, if you look at uh, the evolutionary model, non-living things cannot produce living things. Uh, I like to jokingly say two cannonballs can't get together and have a BB. Uh, it just doesn't <laughs> work that way. Uh, only life can beget life, uh, and, and yet if you roll it all the way back to the beginning, there has to be a starting point that some living being, presumably God, starts the whole process. In that situation, what do you think is the fundamental flaw in their thinking? Well, their basic premise is nothing became everything without any help. And again, that model just doesn't work. I mean, you look at the complexity of life as we have entered the age of the electron microscope and gotten into the heart of the cell and the very core of DNA. We find a complexity there that basically does away with simple life forms. Even inside of a DNA molecule, you'll find nucleotide bases and other components that are all basically small factories that are creating life for creating information that codes life and it doesn't matter how far you're able to break it down how deep we're able to get into that subatomic world it still screams in the beginning God created and we can test that today we can see that that which the Bible presents is actually accurate versus that which evolution proposes which is theory and really not testable or fact and if God was there in the beginning then do we have an accountability to him and is that part of the pushback in this issue? I think that's the whole issue because I think just reason and logic declares if there's one who is capable of speaking all things into existence, then he has the right to issue a moral code to all humanity. And really that is the issue, that is the pushback issue with this particular community. So the real bottom line for all of us is if there really is a God who really made the world in which we exist, we really are accountable to him and the good news is he actually loves you and cares about you. World Prophetic Ministry is a 501c3 nonprofit organization and your gift is tax deductible for the amount that exceeds any fair market value of the materials or resources you receive from us. Thank you for your support.